Hello, yes, and welcome to the Irish Abroad Show for this Thursday evening with myself, Ger Brown, and Paul Tierney. Of course, I'm back in the hot seat after Paul Nealon filled in for me last week. It was the double Paul show, but we're back for the normal uh, run of things myself this week. Paul, uh, how's all with yourself? Obviously, it was the first probably normal weekend of football, probably since pre Christmas. The FA Cup third weekend is now out of the way, which and just back into the run of things and thankfully seems to be less disruptions now with COVID not as many games thankfully seems to be going due to that yeah thank god I think it's become a bit of a piss take the last while especially in England to be honest um, yeah very very weird carry on from the clubs um, yeah especially Arsenal as well on the weekend I mean I know they're missing a load of players there was only one COVID case from what I know and that was Odegaard so yeah Weird carry on the last while. But um, hopefully this weekend, no games called off and uh, go into this mini international break, whatever you call it, the week after with a full round of games under the belt because it's it's just it's ridiculous at this stage. You don't see any other league doing it. So why why does the Premier League call off a game every two minutes, you know? I think we talked about Arsenal, obviously got a lot of attention last weekend because it wasn't really COVID. It was a combination of one COVID cases you touched on couple of injuries and players being gone to the African Cup of Nations. But I think Burnley have really stretched at this stage. There's five mm. games to have in hand now at this stage. And you just know at this stage now that already three or four months of ban, Sean Deutsch is just going to be crying out when they face numerous double game weeks at the end of the season. Like they don't have the tickets to squads anyway. They're after losing their main man in Chris Wood. Like you just can't I know fair enough you might say they've only ten fit senior outfield players, but like they're just not a team that's going to decide uh, designed for double game weeks come the end of the season and it's looking incredibly likely they are going to be in the, the thick depths of a relegation battle this season but while we are on the likes of the tops of Burnley and Arsenal and teams like that we might as well kickstart our weekend review from the Premier League of course there was uh, midweek action as well in the Premier League Irish involvement that's so we'll get that all in um, as well so finally after 26 previous Premier League appearances without a goal Adam Eda finally broke his duck at the top flight of English football as he got the second in Norwich City's 2-1 win over Everton. Uh, strange enough, when I went to look to get player reviews in this, I think the Norfolk Live was the only website online that I could find with player review. And they actually left out Adam Eda for some reason. I can't understand why. I, obviously, it must have been a misprint, but it was just so frustration because it was the only place I could find with Norwich player reviews, whether you have anything, maybe, Paul, that you might be able to offer in a moment. Uh, also in that game as well, saw our only other Irish involvement from the weekend. Seamus Coleman played 54 minutes of this contest as Everton stumps their third defeat in four games and a result that has cost Rafa Benitez his job. Duncan Ferguson now taking over the caretaker range for how long, I don't know. Um, the Liverpool Echo didn't hold back on the Donegal man's rating, only giving him a 3 out of 10, saying, sold Anthony Gordon short with an under-hit pass in the build-up to Norwich's second goal, one of several such occasions from Everton players, and had his hands full dealing um, with Milat, uh, the Norwich player there, Paul, sorry? Milo Rosicca. Rosicca, uh, before making uh, way. So, yeah, he's been kind of the brunt of a good bit of criticism from Norwich fans over the last kind of, or Everton fans over the last kind of couple of weeks, Seamus Coleman. And uh, once again, it, it seems to be the case here. Yeah, definitely. Well done to Norwich, by the way. We were all kind of condemning them to relegation the last couple of weeks. But, I mean, they moved off the bottom of the table now, obviously, because other teams hadn't played as well. And, look, they're still well in it. They've won two more games than Newcastle have this season as well. So that's got to be taken into account. Um, in terms of Mad Adam Eda, brilliant stuff. Uh, well deserved. He was in, he's been playing the last couple of games as well. He's had chances. He's been very close. And uh, look, he's got his goal now and hopefully he can get a few more for the rest of the season. In terms of Everton, I think Rafa Benitez was inevitable. I'm surprised it wasn't sooner. It probably just needed a defeat like that. I'm surprised it wasn't actually after the uh, the Brighton game over over New Year. I Nothing against Brighton. I know they're ahead of Everton this season, but they're kind of a similar club to Norwich really in general. Um, and that was at home too. But look, listen, I'm not surprised he's gone. Duncan Ferguson in now. I think he's the. I think they should just leave him in for the rest of the season because he done well when he came in the last time. They beat Chelsea and they got a nil nil draw with us with Arsenal as well. Obviously, at the time Arsenal weren't. They're still not great, but they they were really in a bad run of form then. Um, 
Yeah, I think he should stay on. I mean, the talks of like Roberto Martinez coming back. I mean, what's the point? You've been there and done that. You don't need to go there again. Like, you know, plus he's managing Belgium. Why would he leave? Um, yeah, I, I mean, Wayne Rooney is probably realistic, but I'd say he'll stick around till the end of the season simply because of the situation Derby are in. Whether there'll be a club or not, we'll talk about that soon in the next while. But um, yeah, great win for Norwich, great for Adam Ida. And uh, look, Hopefully it continues from. I don't have any player ratings because I actually, like yourself, I had the Norfolk Live and it wasn't there. So, look, I'm sure he would have been rated quite highly anyway. Yeah, I can't understand because he even was their main player mentioned in their headline as well and they left him out on this brilliant occasion for him. But I suppose go back to that as well. It's just rewards as well for the likes of, particular for Dean Smith for standing by him because we've seen Daniel Farrick in the past, maybe throw him in from the start or give him a good lengthy run on, be maybe one of your first subs, and it didn't quite happen for him. And then he's resorted back to being last chance saloon, injury time substitute, where Dean Smith has consistently been giving him regular kind of game time. You know, he played very, very well by all accounts in the mid week match against West Ham, unlucky to score. And you would probably say it's just rewards for him as much. And we, we talk about on the show two weeks ago how maybe the appointment or the sacking of Daniel Farrick didn't suit Andrew Owen Bamdedi because he was just starting to set into the team, which would have to say the change in management is now working at wonders for Adam. Yeah, definitely. He's getting opportunities, which he wasn't under Dan Farrick, like you said. Um, I don't I don't see the problem in him playing. I know he doesn't get goals, but no one gets goals in that team, really. So what's the point in not throwing him in every so often? The only one who gets goals is Pookie, and sure, Pookie's past his ter- uh, past thirty years of age, you know, so he's not going to be doing it for much longer at the highest level. Anyway, he did have a good season the first time around, but fell away towards the end. Has got five this season, but again, that's not really enough. Um, yeah, they'll probably make a couple of signings in January as well. Hopefully, Adams still getting in by the end of that, and um, hopefully it continues. From hopefully he gets a couple of more goals, and Norwich can at least fight to stay up, which. They are doing, if you look at it in reality, as I said, they've won two more games than Newcastle have. So that's the reality. Yeah, I think even as well, then goals as a weekend for now, I think that only just now brings them into double figures for goal score this season. We're into January with what, give or take in around the halfway mark of the season. So it does kind of show that it's not just a problem with Adam so far prior to this season putting the ball in the back of it. It's a general type thing as well. We mentioned there was midweek action um, as well. Once again, Ever Ferguson was named on the bench for Brighton but an unused sub and they're thrilling 1-1 draw with Chelsea on Tuesday night. And then last night, obviously, Matt Doherty came on and got an assist for Spurs and their dramatic 3-2 victory away to Leicester. This game kicked off a half an hour before the Manchester United game. That was kind of the game. I was like, oh, I think I'll probably watch that one for tonight. So I was kind of like, right, I'll just watch the first half of this game. Then it goes half time. I'll tune over to the Brentford Community Stadium for the rest of the evening. Then when I seen Leicester went 2-1 in front. I was kind of thinking like, right, might be slightly regretting this. Not much happening in this game. And then I completely kind of zoned out that game. And then check flash score just after finishing, seeing the Tottenham won 3-2 with, with two goals deep in the injury time and realised I probably made a bad, bad decision for the evening, Paul. Yeah, uh, I I had a match myself last night. So when I got home, it was still 2-1 to Leicester. I was going into the 90th minute and I thought, oh, here we go. This is it. But then Spurs obviously nicked it at the end. Uh, poor from Leicester. They've actually been poor all season defensively. They're wide open when you go at them. Um, Matt Doherty got an assist. That's great. Great for Ireland. Great for him. But in a, in a sense for Arsenal, it's not a great result really, to be honest. Like probably needed them to lose because that's one of their games in hand. But look, listen, I still think they'll nick the top four ahead of uh, United and Arsenal. I think with Conte is the turning point for them. He is like he's he's making some of these boys play above themselves, and the ones who aren't playing above themselves are gonna be thrown out. And that's what you have to do. You have to be ruthless as a manager. And I think that's what Conte is. And I am still shocked Man United did not bring him in as the manager when they had the opportunity. Gary never gone on about him. Oh, we need winners. We need winners. Sure, he's the second most successful manager in Europe behind Guardiola in the last few years. So, <laughs> I, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. But yeah, think, look. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's Gary Neville as well was kind of just, I think, made me a bit worried because of his style of football as well. That kind of wouldn't maybe be the most... I catching and most appealing with Manchester United fans. But up at the end of the day, it gets results. I'm one of them up until last night that I haven't been overly sold and convinced by 
uh, contest spell at Spurs so far and all people are pointing out he's won these results they've got these stats and kind of like for me that's just lazy punditry because like I think up mm-hmm. until last night, I think all their wins have been against teams in the bottom half. Three of them have been against Leeds, Norwich, and Watford, all teams in the bottom five of the table or were at the time. So I'm kind of like, they've won games they expected to win. They haven't beaten anyone to show. But last night was kind of a game that was banana skin and in the show the character they did. like So last night is probably the first time, maybe along with the Liverpool draw, that I'd kind of hold my hands up and say, no, that's really impressive by Spurs. But... I still think Manchester United will get fourth just purely because I think that overall that they have the best team on paper of all the teams in the battle for that fourth place. I know you can say, like, well, if that's the case, you know, they, they should be walking it and everyone's been saying that all season. But I do think eventually, a bit like Liverpool last season, I think they'll click. I think they'll get a purple patch and I think they'll just kind of fall over the line and eventually get there. Like I said, for me, once... The old saying, one swallow doesn't make a summer. That's where I'm still with Spurs, right? One really good result last night. Boo-hoo, you've beaten teams you should be beaten anyway. It's now kind of kind of kick on. Where Even though Manchester United are not kind of quite doing that at the moment, I still think I'm more inclined to think it's going to happen for them rather than um, Spurs. And then I haven't even mentioned the likes of West Ham or Arsenal. I think West Ham already, you know, yes, why they currently think Occupy Fort, they've shown frailties in the last couple of weeks. And obviously, other everyone else around them has got games in hand. And then yourselves, Arsenal. Sure, luckily you don't really want to play football. It's a wonder tonight's game is going to hit. Yeah, I hear you. You can't say it, and with your uh, false positives a few weeks ago, don't be starting anything, will you? But um, yeah, I mean, I think with West Ham, I watched them on Sunday. Their their defending was shocking. Like it, like if Leeds is, was bad all the time, Leeds defend like an under fourteen team. West Ham are just as bad, you know, wide open, like, you know. Um, I think with West Ham, what will kill them is the Europa League. It depends how far they go in that. The squad is not that big. They play a lot of the, they play the same starting 11 a lot of the time. Uh, yeah, that will kill. But, I mean, they're still massively overachieving from where they were. You think even when uh, the league came back with COVID, uh, after COVID in the summer that time, they were, they were more, I remember we watched them against Wolves one day and they were shocking. You know, like they were at home, and I know at home didn't matter with their no fans, but they were completely really transformed shocking. since then. Since then, though, yeah, and that, and that's down to David Moyes as well. He yeah. signed well, like the likes of Bowen coming in from Hull. That's a super sign. And now he had an awful miss the other day. I don't know why he didn't just bury it because, like, he has been the last couple of weeks. But uh, yeah, I mean, I think West Ham fall away. Arsenal, I think getting into Europe is the main priority. It doesn't matter what it is, just get into Europe, and. Um, I just don't agree in United. I just think they're a really bad team. There's just some really poor players in that United side. So, like, I know they've got Ronaldo, but still, the fact that you've had to go out and get him to make yourselves look a bit better. I know he didn't I know he didn't score last night. Yeah, Bruno Fernandes is a winger. Every time there's uh, a break in play, he's up at the referee giving out about something. And uh, the defence is just not... At it. Varane looks like half the player he was at Madrid as well. So, I don't know. I just think with Spurs, Conte... I, I know they haven't been great, but they probably wouldn't have got those results under Nuno. So, you know, that's still an improvement. But they have to improve in the game. Like, they have Chelsea on the weekend. They have to improve in that because they were just battered by Chelsea in the two League Cup games. Chelsea near, Chelsea didn't even get out of second gear. So, like, yeah, there you go. Um, hopefully, Matt Doherty's involved a bit more as well. He's done well when he's come on. Uh, you had the game against Southampton over Christmas as well. And then he got an assist last night. So hopefully he's involved. I think he's better than Emerson Royale. He doesn't offer that much either. So, you know. Yeah, time will probably only really tell, I suppose, on that one. I suppose that's kind of all wrapped up from an Irish kind of point of view uh, from the Premier League over the last week or so. So, Paul, there's been a lot in the Championship. Not quite a double game week, but there was a good few uh, fixtures there midweek as well. So a lot of eating and drinking, you could say, from the second tier of English football is always the case if you want to give us the, the roll down. Yeah, we'll start with the weekend anyway. So on Saturday, uh, Daryl Lennon helped Blackburn keep a clean sheet as they beat James Collins and Mark McGuinness's Cardiff 1-0. Mark Travers was beaten in the last minute as Luton were beaten, uh, as Luton beat Bournemouth 3-2. That was on Sky, actually. That was a cracking end to that game. I actually turned over just after that. Boring Man City-Chelsea game where Chelsea just sat in even though they needed to win. Uh, Festi Ebisele grabbed an assist as Derby moved off the bottom of the table with a 2-0 win against Sheffield United. 
Uh, Jason Knight, Aaron Cashin, John Egan, and David McGoldrick also played in that as well for both sides. Uh, we I mentioned Derby earlier. Uh, Joran Gillette actually when they got one of their goals, they were uh, the reporter at the game said it was announced that they they need to justify finance uh, being able to pay bills by February or they'll be thrown out of the league. So I mean, after probably one of the highs of the season for them, well they've had many to be fair to them. Um. Looks like they might be getting, might be ended uh, sooner rather than later, even without a relegation fight. Yeah, it's it's very very sad, and I suppose you can't can't help but think back to the championship playoff final when they lost to Aston Villa not that awfully long ago, and how things could be so different because if they'd won that game, you know who's to say they wouldn't be in Aston Villa's situation, Corsi, the the money coming in, everything else like that. Like Aston Villa, not long before that. We're in dire financial situation themselves. And to be honest, that win is kind of kickstart where they are now. Who's to say they wouldn't be where they are, where Derby are now, if that game hadn't gone their way that day in I think it was in May twenty nineteen. But it's mad to even think that like they've you know in the space of two and a half years, they've just in general they've come from being on the cusp of the Premier League to everything they've kind of gone through the last kind of couple of years. Last season was was dodgy, was dicey, they possibly arguably should have been relegation instead of Sheffield Wednesday. And this season, they continue to define the odds in terms of football on the football field. You think with all their points deductions and everything else like that, that you should be gone. Like they didn't, they weren't even able to allow to, to re-sign Phil Jagiel the other day, even though at thirty nine, was still doing a really good job. Some like on paper, I think they've a very very good team, but the likelihood, I think we touched on before, you know, they are going to have to probably sell Paris this month. Jason Knight in particular been linked to the likes of Leeds, Burnley. Newcastle, I think Leeds for me would probably be the best bet for him, best suit in terms of style of football. And also with their injury crisis at the moment, I think he's a good chance he could possibly be thrown more or less straight in there. And I think Bielsa as well would be a great manager for him. Where with Newcastle, too much uncertainty. Burnley, don't think style of football would suit him. But yeah, it's mad to kind of think like they're like defying odds that they're even within touching distance of the relegation zone. They'd be comfortably mid table only for the points deduction. But like you said, you know, you think they should be on a high after the win on Saturday and then you hear that news and you kind of hand help but feel that like there's something kind of always, you kind of kind of feel like you all should be looking over your shoulder, that kind of feeling that, you know, weakens the stomach or everything else, kind of like that. It's scary, it's worrying because of a club that with great history and great tradition. You know, we've seen what happened with Berry a couple of years ago and you never wish that in another football club, but here we are again, two and a half years later. Mm, yeah, you look at even Bolton that year as well. They were so close to being a uh, being thrown out before yeah. they were bought over. Just it was, I think it was the same day as Barry as well. So yeah, look at look at Bolton now. They've got back up to League One. They are struggling this year, but look, fantastic stuff from them. Um, we move on anyway from Derby. Uh, go to Bristol City. Callum O'Dowd, uh, his Bristol City side were beaten six two by Fulham. Fulham who are deciding to play football again the last couple of weeks, have won 7-0, 6-2 and 6-2, three games in a row. We'll talk about the other 6-2 later. Uh, Cyrus Christie, Ryan Manning and Michael Obafemi helped Swansea draw 1-1 with high-flying Huddersfield. Uh, Aaron Connolly played 67 minutes as Middlesbrough beat Reading 2-1 at the Riverside. Dan McNamara got a yellow card in Millwall's 1-0 defeat to Nottingham Forest, late 1-0 defeat there. Uh, Jack Taylor grabbed an assist, but Peterborough were beaten 4-1 by Coventry City. Sammy Smodjic's played in that as well. Uh, Alan Brown got an assist and Scott Hogan scored as Preston and Birmingham drew 1-1 at Deepdale. Greg Cunningham and Sean McGuire all both played in that as well. Um, it was a clean sheet for Jimmy Dunn as QPR beat West Brom 1-0 at Loftus Road. Callum Robinson, Jason Malumby, Taylor Gardner, Hickman all played for West Brom in that as well. And Sean McLaughlin played in the live game as Hull City were beaten 2 0 by Stoke City at the KC Stadium. I don't think it's called that anymore, but it still is to me. Um, we go to midweek, a couple of things. Alan Brown scored in Preston's comeback draw against Sheffield United. A lot of Irish involvement in this one. Connor Horhan, John Egan, Enda Stevens, David McGoldrick, and Greg Cunningham all played in that for either side. And probably the most impressive result of the week this week, in my opinion, Hull beat Blackburn 2-0 at the KC Stadium as well. That's a rearranged game from Stevens there, I think it was. And Sean McLaughlin played. He kept he helped the side keep a clean sheet. And that's Blackburn's first defeat since November, which was obviously that 7-0 defeat to Fulham. So, look, Blackburn have been flying. And what a result that is. Uh, fantastic stuff for Sean uh, and, uh, and Hull as well. 
And the last bit of information, uh, Peter Chioso, he went back to Luton from his loan spell at MK Dons and he played the full 90 minutes as they beat Reading 2-0 at the Majeki Stadium. So, yeah, fantastic stuff from Sean McLaughlin again yeah, last night and fantastic result for Hull. Yeah, um, just even I think prior to that, we touched on with Blackburn's win against Cardiff. I think there was seven, eight clean sheets in eight games or eight and nine, one or the other for Blackburn since that pace team by Fulham and Darrell Lenehan at the harsh that they've plummeted themselves right up into promotion mix. That would be a setback losing that game against a whole city team who have been improving in recent weeks. I think a lot of people have seen them live on the BBC a couple of weeks ago and they were very impressive in the FA Cup against Everton. But massive win there for Hull. Sean has been absolutely flying at the last couple of weeks. I think he was named their player of the month as well for December. So absolutely mm -hmm. fan fantastic to see. Um, also, just as well to mention for midweek, uh, Scott Hogan uh, played in that game. Uh, that eight goal thriller, Craven Cottage, uh, but his Birmingham side, obviously, as you touched on, beaten 6 2 by Fulham, who just decided to, as you say, play football and decided to rack up cricket scores. 19 goals in the last three games. It's absolutely ridiculous. Mitrovic on 27 goals this season, and we're only in mid January. Just uh, one other bit of news as well from the Championship. Uh, Jordan Shipley, he, came, he actually started for commentary seat in that 4 1 victory against uh, Peterborough. That's his second start in a row. And also, as you touched on there as well, uh, appearances at the weekend for Cyrus Christie for Swansea and Aaron Connolly for Middlesbrough, both making their new debuts, uh, well, their debuts, I should say, for their new respective clubs, both on loan there for the rest of the season. So, fingers crossed that all goes well for them. Yeah, definitely, I agree. Um, that's all I've got from the championship, man. You, you, you said you didn't have League One, did you, or you didn't have the championship? I do. Um, no, I just, I just wanna... have who's kind of done yeah, what. Yeah, yeah, one, yeah. I suppose time one players because we'll probably be here till yeah, yeah, the that's... three o'clock on Saturday going through everything. So just from League One, from both this is both mm -hmm. from the weekend and again a couple of rearranged midweek matches. Uh, Anthony Pilkington uh, grabbed a ninety-fifth minute for Fleetwood Town as they bet. Rotherham 1-0, his first goal of the season. Big blow for Rotherham there and Chinoze Obene and uh, Jimmy Coyote as well. As they, of course, uh, massively pushing for promotion to the Championship. Uh, Kieran Sadler, of course, as well, should also add a, another Irish contingent at the Yorkshire mm -hmm. Club. Will Keane got the winner for Wigan, while James McLean got an assist for their opening goal in their 2-1 win away to Doncaster. That, of course, wasn't Keane's only involvement this week, so a touch on him. In a moment, but that's McLean's fourth assist this season and his tenth goal involvement overall in the league. And uh, this season in League One, he's absolutely flying it since he's moved there in the summer. Two minutes after we introduced a half time, Aidan O'Brien scored for Sunderland, but they were held to a uh, 1 1 draw by Accrington Stanley. That's his second goal of the season. His previous one was back in October, so he'd been waiting a while for that one. Gavin, Bajou, Gavin Bazunu kept a clean sheet as Portsmouth drew 0 0 with AFC Wimbledon. I think this is now moving on to the midweek games. Uh, that clean sheet now means he's 10 for the season. He's the joint highest in the division, so he's doing very, very well and building up his reputation, continues to build up his reputation for such a young age. And then finally, as I mentioned, Will Keane made a 2-2 two and two this week as he found the net in Wigan's 2-1 victory away to Morecambe. That's now 14 goals for him this season, 13 in the league, and that has him the fourth highest scorer in the division. Good stuff, good stuff. Flying Will Keane is definitely pro clearly justifying his controversial picks for Ireland yeah. anyway, that's for sure. Uh, um, I don't think it's controversial. I, I just I remember the first time when he was in and Scully wasn't, there was a bit of talk about it. That's that's the only reason I'm saying it. That's all. That's all. That's all. I don't think it's controversial. I think it's deserved. Look, he's proved it the last while, and Wigan are flying. You talk about Wigan as well. Like they've got four games in hand on the team in, in first place as well. Like they're only a point behind them. So if they won three, even three of those four games, they'd be well ahead of everyone else because they've all played more games than Wigan. So, yeah, they're flying. And look, James and Will are doing fantastic stuff as well. Um, Another club as well that's been through financial troubles the last while, and they've come through it. So hopefully that's an example yeah. of how things are going to turn out for Derby County. Yeah, similar to Derby when they went down. Wigan were above 50 points when they went down. Yeah, they I shouldn't they have been relegated. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and Sheffield Wednesday weren't relegated and it was a similar situation. I know they're down now, but look, there's so many. Football's weird, especially in England. People who run them are just very weird the last while. Um, 
League two, anyway, there's one bit of information. Paddy O'Connor scored a late winner for Bradford against Salford, and he made the team of the week for Bradford as well. That's good stuff from Paddy and good stuff from Bradford City as well. And one thing from the non-league, Paddy Madden got a goal. Where is that? I have it somewhere. Paddy Madden got a goal as a Stockport beat Eastleigh 3-0. They're having a very good season. Stockport actually opened the playoff spots near and around the top as well. So uh, good stuff from Paddy. I mean, probably too low a level for him, really. I think we spoke about that already. Yeah, but uh, that's just also how some things kind of work out in football. I suppose he's kind of getting into the latter stage of his career, so maybe just a combination of injuries or anything else like that might be kind of catching up on him. I did see something a few weeks ago, though, that he's one of the highest paid players in the National League, so he's still making a very good living and fortune for himself. Just to add on your point as well there from League Two, yeah, Paul O'Connor, third goal of the season. I think he's been named in the League Two team of the season for the halfway point of the season. He's absolutely flying it there, the former Limerick um Player. And just one other bit of news as well from League Two. I have former under-21 international Harry Charles. He got a brace as Mansfield bet Warsaw 2-0 on Saturday. He was only brought on at half-time, so he had a massive impact in this game. And then them goals actually turned out to be his first two of the campaign as well. So uh, he's, by all accounts, having a good season there, the former Ireland under-21 international. Of course, Paul will also, Neil will also be familiar with him as well as he came up through the ranks at Everton. Yeah, uh, Mansfield, load of Irish involvement, like you've said before. I actually forgot to look at their result this weekend. Uh, we're unlucky in the FA Cup a few weeks ago against Middlesbrough. Got back into it, but we were beaten by a late, a late on goal from John Joe O'Toole, actually. So that was unfortunate. Um, Another Irish man. I'll move on. Into, yeah, no, that's a proper Irish name as well. That is, so is Paddy O'Connor, to be fair. Um, I'll move on into, we'll actually just briefly mention uh, Roberto Lopez, the Crumlin man, obviously playing for K30. He won the man of the match on, I think it was, I think it was Monday or Tuesday evening, as K30 drew 1-1 with host Cameroon, which saw them, it ultimately has now put them through into the next round. They'll play Saudi Omanis, Senegal. So I'm sure, Jer, you want Roberto Lopez to do well, but now you want them to do even better. Um, let Saudi go back to you for the next few weeks. I didn't actually think of that. I thought at first, like, surely you're just being sarcastic here with, with me being a Pats fan. And I was thinking, great opportunity to see him get destroyed by Sadio Mane. But actually, no, I wouldn't mind if, on this occasion for 90 minutes, if um, Sadio Mane spends most of it in Roberto Lopez's back pocket. And for once, I wouldn't mind seeing him playing well. Uh, I haven't really been overly following the African Cup of Nations, to be, to be brutally honest. Uh, probably, I'm not even going to say it's largely down to work. It's largely just due to pure laziness. But... Um, yeah, but it's a fantastic achievement for um, for Cape Verde. They wouldn't be recognised as one of the bigger nations in Africa. You see the likes of Ghana, I think, have been knocked out. Algeria, mm-hmm. you might maybe inform me a little bit more, but I know that they yeah they're they struggling were they after. were three one down yeah they were three one down to Ivory Coast today, and they only had a point from three games, so yeah. they're gone. Um, yeah, yeah, they're, 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 they're the reigning holders. champions as well. Yeah, oh god, that's a disaster. And it's not like City team. need them back either, like. <laughs> yeah, and they're a team I would have looked at as well, provided they go on to qualify from it. There's no guarantee they will now after the shambles of a tournament for them. But they're a team I would look at for the end of the year to be a dark horse to do well in the World Cup and maybe be the the furthest going African team and to possibly get to a quarter final. But like there you go, it just shows that sometimes like you said with Manchester United, just having all the names and paper doesn't always kind of quite work out. Um I don't have anything else, uh, but I know you, you have the roundup there for Scotland and also Josh Cullen's involvement from Belgium and Jay O'Shea once again representing the Irish name down in the A League. Yeah, anyway, we'll start with Scotland. Any Scotland, Scottish uh, top division was back on Monday evening and Jake Doyle Hayes played the full 90 minutes as Celtic beat Hibs 2 0 in the return game. Liam Scales and, and James McCarthy were only used subs for Celtic in that. Uh, Celtic were tuning up fairly quickly and that's it was probably game over before Hibbs even started playing um, Johnny Hayes played in Aberdeen's 1-1 draw with Rangers at Pataudry that was on Sky Sports it was actually quite lively when I was watching it anyway and obviously we had fond memories of Scott Brown playing for Celtic and he was taking the piss out of the Rangers player I think it was uh, Ryan Jack or Ryan Kent getting sent off on Tuesday evening funny stuff um, Alan Power scored an own goal, but St. Mirren won away at Tannadice Park as they beat Gundy United 2 1. Connor Ronan, Joe Shocknessy, and Charles Dunn played in that too. No Jamie McGrath there. Uh, Aaron McAniff played 20 minutes in Hearts 2 0 win over Dan Cleary, St. Johnson. Dan Cleary making his debut for St. Johnson there, which is good to see.
sorry. And um, yes, what else do we have from Europe? Sorry, I just have to find out. I don't know where I wrote that. Yes, Europe. Josh Cullen played full 90 minutes in Anderlecht. 1-1 one, one draw with standard Liège. Probably disappointing there. Anderlecht were 1-0 up, but they can see the late goal against standard who are near to the bottom of the league. And uh, Jay O'Shea played the full 90 minutes for Brisbane Roar as they drew 2 all with Sydney FC. And they've still got no win, only one point from all the games they've played so far. But I think that league has been hammered by COVID the last while as well as every other league. Well, every, every all the prem, all the English leagues anyway. So, um, yeah, disappointing for Brisbane Roar, disappointing for Jay and Josh. But look, they're back playing. That's the main thing. And sure, like your favorite league in the world, there's no relegation. So what they what do they have to worry about anyway? Yeah, look, you can you don't have to win a game. What's the point? It's grand. Like, you know, you just go out and get paid. That's it. It's grand. Yeah. It's fine. It's, it's it's a, I, I a non-existent league. That. It's you a non-existent see. league in your eyes. Just one last thing before we might finish up. I didn't. I'm not apart from like obviously keeping an eye on Anderlecht results and where they're in the rounds of the table. It completely slipped under my mind and my radar. Now maybe someone who's more of a an expert in Belgian football might be able to enlighten us more on this, but to hear Standard Liège near the bottom of the table is quite a bit of a shock. Like they would be, mm-hmm. I would always would have viewed would have been kind of one of the higher teams up in uh, Belgian football. Now I know it's a long time ago. I think it's going to be fourteen years this August since they played Liverpool in the Champions League qualifier. But they brought Liverpool to extra time, and this is around the time mm-hmm. Liverpool were going really strong with the likes of Steven Gerrard, Javier Mascherano, Xabi Alonso, Fernando Torres. Like I wouldn't say. Probably the peak of Liverpool under Rafa Benitez era, you could say. Um, so to hear them sip down, like you know, it's a bit of a surprise. Now maybe it's been the writing's been on the wall for a while. Like, I haven't seen their name mentioned European competition for a while, but yeah, it is a bit of a bit of a shock. But then again, a lot of people would say Anderlecht only battled out for European places in Belgium is also a step back from the heights that they're used to. Yeah, definitely. Um, in terms of standard Liège, anyway, they were in Arsenal's Europa League group in 2019 20. It's obviously not this season anyway because we're not in Europe. But um, yeah, they actually uh, Arsenal needed to get a result against them in the last game of the group that year anyway, and uh, they were two 0 up. And Arsenal, it ended up being too well because Arsenal had to go and play eventually. But uh, yeah, they were two 0 up, and they look they look fairly strong that day. So maybe it's just one of those seasons for them. You mentioned the Liverpool playoff as well. They were in Arsenal's Champions League group one year as well. When Arsenal, were, God, that's a long time ago. When Arsenal were in the Champions League as well. So um, yeah, look, it's I think just Belgian football. I think it's always going to be Club Bruges. I know they're not top this year. This is a new team top this year. I've never heard of them. I think they only came up last year as well. Union Saint Gil Gilwar or something. I can't say them properly, but um, you yes, I mean you, mad underlector. USG, yeah, we'll go with that. Go with that, easy. Um, yeah, but under like, I mean, they're fighting back for Europe anyway. They haven't been in in a while. They were unlucky not to qualify this year. Obviously, lost to Vitesse, the conquerors of Tottenham Hotspur, the mighty Tottenham Hotspur. But um, yeah, yeah, interesting, interesting stuff. And hopefully, Josh keeps playing. I, I don't see him dropping out unless he gets injured. Anyway, that's for sure. Yeah, and it's looking like as well. There's a possibility that he could be coming up against the national team. Of the league that he plays in in March, there's some possibility rumours going around that it could be Belgium that could be lined up for the home game um, in March. The FAI, obviously, you know, we're looking, I think, the lines along the lines of the likes of England, but they've opted to get two home games. I think France, Croatia, but I think they're going over to Qatar to play in the tournament. I think, I remember Gary Spain mentioned to me, Italy was in the pipeline uh, back before Christmas, but that could obviously got thrown out the window because of our neighbours up north forced them into a playoff. So um, it'd be great to get someone like Belgium because I think, look, we all know the FBI could do with a, a good cash in from um, a high profile friendly that's probably going to be likely to sell out. So from well, likely restrictions should be lifted at that stage back to full stadiums. And look, it'd be great to see Ireland test himself again against one of the best teams in, in the world. Um, I suppose that's pretty much it for, for this week's show. Unless maybe you just want to quickly add anything on that last bit there, Paul. Uh, j- just hopefully we can go to that. It'd be nice to see Belgium. I mean, they probably underachieved. We probably expected a bit more of them the last one, but it'd still be nice to see a couple of their players. And hopefully we can put it up to them because we put it up to Portugal. So why can't we put it up to them, even if it is only a friendly? And uh, hopefully we can have full capacity because, as you said, it looks like it will be. And with the Six Nations being on, I'm sure the government and all want people coming in and having full stadiums to make a bit of money, especially with the rugby, which... 
always you're seems not, to be the you're way. Not, you're not the first person to say that to me. I work, even though I'm, I'm based down now here in Tipperary, I actually work with a woman originally from Swords, and she made the exact same sly, smart comment and remark. It's a good thing Gary Spain Look, isn't here only to go defending the rugby heads. I have, nothing I, have nothing, I have nothing against the rugby, but it's always the way. That's yeah, all. I, I think, look, even as things stand at the moment, there are, you're currently allowed 5,000 people in the Aviva. There's no fear, no worry that all them people will be there anyway. And sure, look, there's a reason why one camera, or sorry, one stand is not shown on the camera. Yes, mm. exactly. <laughs> anyway, look, let's 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 leave it there because we're we're possibly getting ourselves into a little bit of choppy water. Uh, thanks very much. Thanks for everyone who got their comments in there. From everyone who's uh, been watching, keep tuned. We'll have more content uh, coming up on the channel over the course of the next while or so, and hopefully we can be back again next Thursday with lots more to review. Thanks very much for joining me, Stephen Paul. Thanks, lads. Thanks, Jared. Top stuff. Take care now.